And hello, everyone. Thanks so much for joining us for CBN Newswatch. I am George Thomas. Well, the president is publicly uh, raising the stakes for his tax reform plan, saying the GOP will pay a price in next year's midterm elections if they don't pass it. His plan slash the corporate uh, tax rate to 20 percent and double the standard deduction that most Americans use. Heather Sells has a story. And I think we're going to get our tax President tax Trump tax warned tax House Republicans on Sunday that failing to pass tax reform would mean failing at the polls next year. And he's stepping up the pressure for a tax bill, saying it's what the people want. It'll be the biggest cuts ever in the history of this country. And uh, I think that there's tremendous appetite, there's tremendous spirit for it. The president and Republicans are desperate for a win. They control both chambers of Congress, but have yet to repeal Obamacare or pass any significant legislation. Many in the party fear an all-out revolt by voters next year if tax reform fails. To that end, House Speaker Paul Ryan says he wants to pass a revised Senate budget bill this week and ultimately accept the Senate tax plan. That would avoid negotiations between a House and Senate version that could drag out the process. We're hearing now that the House may go ahead and either take the Senate amendments or move very quickly to accept the Senate amendments, and we may save as many as 10 or 12 legislative days, which is a big deal. The president promoted the plan in a USA op-ed piece this weekend, citing an out-of-control tax code that is nearly tripled in length since the last tax reform in 1986. It's 2,650 pages, plus another 70,000 pages of forms and instructions. And saying that tax foundation figures show that taxes cost Americans more out of pocket than housing, clothing, and food combined. On Capitol Hill, deficit hawks are worried that the president's tax cuts will add even more to the country's $20 trillion debt. They want to pay for them by cutting deductions or with tough spending cuts. But the president insists an expanding economy will save the day. If we pick up one point on GDP, that's $2.5 trillion, if you think of it. 2.5, it more than pays for everything. The president is pushing hard because he promised tax reform on the campaign trail and wants to deliver now, not just for the future of his party, but because he believes it's important for the country. Heather Sell, CBN News. Thanks, Heather. The fate of Army Sergeant Bo Bergdahl is now in the hands of a judge. Bergdahl faces up to life in prison after pleading guilty to desertion and misbehavior when he left his post back in 2009 in Afghanistan. A sentence hearing begins Monday. The judge is expected to weigh factors including Bergdahl's willingness to admit guilt, his five years of captivity in the hands of the Taliban, and the serious wounds that several uh, service members suffered while searching for him. In other news in the region, the bodies of at least 67 people have been found in a town in Syria that was once Islamic State territory. Syrian troops and allied militias regained control of the town, but quickly discovered that ISIS, what ISIS had done, rather, some civilians were shot in the street as ISIS militants retreated from the town. The Britain-based Syrian Observatory for Human Rights documented the killings of at least 128 people during the last days of ISIS's control of the town. As you can imagine, the death toll is expected to raise. Secretary of State Rex Tillerson is pushing Saudi Arabia and Iraq to unite together in order to counter growing Iranian aggression. Tillerson participated in an annual meeting of the Saudi Arabia-Iraq Coordination Committee Sunday. He met with Iraq's prime minister and Saudi Arabia's king. Uh, Saudi Arabia's king. The U.S. is trying to seal a new alliance between the two nations in hopes of isolating the Islamic Republic of Iran. Tillerson has also called for European countries and companies to cut ties with that nation. Many American Christians are seeking a third great awakening, but Native Americans among them say you can't have a national revival without national repentance. CBN's Paul Strand heard why at a gathering called All Tribes D.C. When Native American Christians worship and party, they really know how to get down. When the wind That's what they were doing at this gathering called All Tribes D.C. in the nation's capital. 
It's one of the few places you'll hear the national anthem sung in Choctaw. No. They also came with a cause. This is All Tribes DC. Native Americans have always been known as warrior people, but now many of the Christians among them want to war for revival and reconciliation for the land and for the Lord Jesus that they love. Native American spiritual leader, Nagel Big Pond. All Tribes DC is a vision to change a nation, to, to release the Great Awakening or the Great Revival. They're working to see prophecies fulfilled that go all the way back to Billy Graham. When he spoke to the Navajo Nation in the early 70s, and he said, you as the Native Americans are like the sleeping giant. And when you awaken, you will become the evangelist. But they know for a spiritual revival to come to all peoples, there must first be reconciliation. And that takes apologizing and forgiving. Big Pond says if the U.S. apologized for what it did to its Native Americans, the rest of the world could no longer bludgeon the U.S. with that. That other countries that didn't like America feed from what happened to the Native people. Germany, Hitler used that against the Jews. He understood what America did with the First Nation people. In 2016, the First Nation people took the first step, coming to D.C. to forgive those who persecuted them. Now they're after the next step, an apology from national leaders. Of this land, we know, having released forgiveness, even for to the nation that has never asked for it, we believe that should they release the apology, it would unlock this nation. Big Pond believes President Trump is just the man to do it because he's a non-politician. It would take a president that's not integrated, I think, into all the politics of things, that has a, a, a heart, a spirit, an ideal. An idealist will always look for different things and changes. The Native Americans here say, what does America have to lose from experimenting with a national act of apology? And surely the Lord will bless it, and there might be much to gain. Paul Strand, CBN News, reporting from All Tribes, D.C. Thanks, Paul. Coming up, they were a family who faced a $1,000 a month jump in their health premiums until they discovered a faith-based solution. Learn about the Christian health share programs when we come back. And welcome back to the broadcast. Affordable health care remains a dream for many Americans. Christians across the country are turning to a faith-based solution. Caitlin Burke brings us the story. As Washington tangles over health insurance, many Americans are taking matters into their own hands. I wanted something that um, wasn't going to be the, the same sort of trap that I had been in. Attorney Steven Strohsneider and his wife Jennifer have three young boys and a baby on the way. Two years ago, they paid $500 a month for insurance. The premium's been steadily rising, and this year would have hit $1,500 a month, a 52% jump from where it started. We try to, to find the best deals that we can, and even the best deals uh, that we could find were going up and up. And according to our insurance broker, it was just everybody's was going up because of Obamacare, and uh, they could we could choose a, a different provider, but the difference may be $10 or $15 a month. There wasn't going to be a huge savings uh, whichever insurance company we went with. So Stephen and his family took a leap of faith by approaching health care in a more biblical way, a Christian health share. Your brothers and sisters in Christ have have committed themselves as being part of this family that that loves you enough to say, I'm going to help you out when your burden exceeds your ability to bear it. There are a number of Christian health sharing ministries, including Samaritan Ministries, Christian Healthcare Ministries, and Liberty Health Share. The Strohsneiders chose MediShare. Unlike traditional insurance companies, a health share collects monthly dues and then distributes the money to members who have medical bills that exceed an annual amount that they've chosen to be responsible for. We've selected for our family to have a uh, our own household responsibility of 5,000 a year. So we know that 
out of our own pockets, we're going to be responsible for $5,000 worth of, of healthcare cost. And that that's just the, the, our own responsibility that we'll take charge of. If medical needs exceed that amount in a given year, they notify their health share and receive a check to pay their health care providers. I'm responsible for it, but my fellow members are making a commitment that they're going to help me meet those responsibilities that exceed $5,000. The Strohsniders feel that being a part of a Christian health share allows them to take some of the teachings that they've heard about in church and read about in the Bible and live them out. Uh, we can see a picture of the church in Acts 2 where the, the church shares everything in common and the believers um, they share their position, uh, possessions and make sure that everybody is taken care of and that when there's a need, you meet it. And uh, we're also told to, to be responsible for our households. And so what I see is um, Christian health share helps you do both of those things. The Strohsniders say two things really stand out to them about being a part of this ministry. First, they've received prayer when they call to ask a question or get more information about their coverage. It was really uplifting and encouraging and not a moment that you would ever associate with health care or insurance, or at least I wouldn't have. And second, each month they receive an email about families being helped by their share, encouraging a note or prayer on the family's behalf. Every time I do that, it, it helps me have the confidence and understanding that in my hour of need, when our family may need it, there are going to be other people out there that want to do the same thing. Since these are Christian health share ministries, there are limitations. Members agree to abide by a Christian lifestyle. Failure to do so could lead to uncovered medical costs. For example, if you were involved in a car accident after drinking, you'd be required to pay your own health bills. Becoming pregnant out of wedlock would also not be covered. Stephen believes his family would stay with their program even if Washington succeeds in overhauling health care with lower premiums and better coverage. I feel that there is a way that I'm contributing to the, the family of Christ that I'm doing now that I can't do through traditional insurance. And so I don't want to go back in, into a method that ignores the needs of my brothers and sisters. Caitlin Burke, CBN News, Waynesboro, Virginia. Up next, Gospel Music Hall of Famer Richard Smallwood talks about the struggle with depression that he kept hidden for decades. And welcome back to the broadcast. It's been called one of the church's dirty little secrets, and many people who suffer from it feel ashamed. It is depression, a serious mental health illness affecting millions, including one famous Grammy-winning gospel musician. My colleague John Jessup talked with Richard Smallwood about the suffering he hid for decades. Every morning you see about me. Each week, these voices fill the halls of Howard University's historic chapel. Every morning you see about me. The gospel choir sings across the country and around the world. He washed my sins away representing soulful musicality and salt and light wherever they go. Today, members of the Howard Gospel Choir serve as ambassadors for the university. Hard to believe it was just several decades ago that gospel was banned by the music department and any music major caught playing anything other than classical could be suspended. Gospel music was a no-no. Richard Smallwood, considered a living legend in gospel music, was one of the choir's founding members. We knew how to switch from the latest gospel song to Bach in three seconds flat. If somebody said, here comes the Dean, we go right from whatever we were playing to Bach or Chopin until he passed the door and then we go right on back to, to our gospel. His love of music started early. My mother tells the story that uh, before I could talk, when I would come home from church on Sunday mornings, I would hum whatever hymn they sang at church. His mother helped young Richard develop an ear for all kinds of music, raising him on Ella Fitzgerald, Peggy Lee, and the Roberta Martin singers. I was growing up this little kid with all these crazy tastes. From a small kids choir it's here. to his current group vision, Smallwood's career includes a Grammy, multiple Dove and Stellar awards, 
and a place in the Gospel Music Hall of Fame. He's also collaborated with the likes of Shaka Khan, Aretha Franklin, and Bill Gaither, with whom he wrote, Jesus, you're the center of my joy. Whitney Houston showcased his song, I Love the Lord, in the movie, The Preacher's Wife. And last summer, His anthem, Total Praise, was performed at the White House for Pope Francis, broadcast around the world. Even with all this success and acclaim, Smallwood, an ordained minister, revealed last year that his signature sound came from a place of pain. It got to the point where I couldn't get out of bed, I wouldn't get in the shower. The only time I would sort of go out was if we had somewhere to sing. He says a series of tragedies, including the deaths of close friends and learning that his stepdad was not his biological father, landed him in what he describes as a dark well. That led him to a minister from his church who was also a licensed clinical psychologist. After seeing her for a while, she said, Richard, you're 100% clinically de depressed. The talks helped, but he remained in that dark hole. I had to get on medication which was a major decision for me because I was afraid. You know, I heard so many horror stories, but it wasn't getting any better. The same man who encouraged concert goers with lyrics like, there's healing for your sorrow, healing for your soul, says he felt like a fraud. They're coming up to me saying, your song saved me from this, or your song ministered to me in this. And I go off the stage and go back to the hotel and close the door, and I'm hurting. Pain he kept hidden. Because it's such a stigma, you're ashamed. I think certainly uh, the church doesn't talk about it, and certainly my culture doesn't talk about it. So it was sort of a double kind of thing. I didn't want anybody to know. Christian counselor Dr. Christine Buckingham says depression can affect anyone. Certainly having a relationship with Christ where we understand, begin to understand our identity, who identities in Christ can really deal with and correct some of the thinking errors that we have, but it doesn't make anyone immune. And we can look in scripture and see many cases of depression. She believes churches and pastors need to better address mental illness and applauds high profile Christians like Sheila Walsh and Smallwood for openly sharing their battles. When someone can stand up there and say, this is what my struggle is, this is who I am, it can really demythologize what the process is, it can also um, encourage them because they can see that there's a good outcome. All the glory, all the honor, from all nations and all people. Smallwood's been off medication for the past seven years and still sees his therapist from time to time. He credits his recovery to <laughs> prayer and counseling. Smallwood's also just finished Anthology, a compilation project he calls the soundtrack of his life. But he's now turned to writing his autobiography, which Smallwood hopes will help many more potentially hiding their battle with depression. I had no idea just sharing my story would, would encourage others. When they see someone who has been successful in some kind of way, talk about the stuff they had to get through to get to that point, that encourages them to say, well, if they can make it, I can. John Jessup, CBN News, Washington. Terrific. You know, there's a saying that says, crowns are made in the crucibles of life. And there's a testimony of a, of a gentleman who has managed to break through all of that. Well, folks, we will be back right after this. Stay with us. And welcome back to the broadcast. In what some are calling a turning point in Israeli-Christian relations, the Israeli government invited Christian journalists to Jerusalem and rolled out the red carpet. CBN Middle East Bureau Chief Chris Mitchell has a story. The Christian journalists were honored by Israel's prime minister, president, and political and you, leaders. Israel has no better friends, I mean that, no better friends in the world than the Christian communities around the world. As we say in Hebrew, kol hakavod, all the respect. God bless all of you. They came for the first ever Christian Media Summit, 
sponsored by the Israeli government. The representative in this uh, uh, Christian Media Summit represent over one billion Christian Zionists. And they pray for us, they join us, they support the state of Israel, no matter politics, right to left wing, doesn't matter. They support the state of Israel with all the heart. Israeli government minister Zippy Hotavelli and Naftali Bennett said how important it is that Christians take action. This is really a historic thing that we started it and we want it to become a tradition. Understanding that Israel is, is on the right side of things, that we're fighting for freedom, fighting for values, and we need your support. We need the Christians around the world to back Israel, to be out there and never be silent. 130 media executives and journalists, including CBN CEO Gordon Robertson, came from around the world to join the event. I tell Christian journalists, remember Psalm 126. Then they said among the nations, the Lord has done great things for them. Uh, that needs to be our watchword. It was important for us to see many people coming together and getting the plans uh, uh, that God has for Israel and for our Christian nations to be together with Israel. Participants said it was a great opportunity to connect with Israel. I think it's, it's just opened up so many avenues for um, more information, more information flows both ways. Um, and it's an important story, it's the most important story. This is a real sign that the Israeli government recognised the contribution, particularly made by Christian broadcasters around the world in defending Israel and the Jewish people. It's especially important in these days of so-called fake news for Christian media to tell the truth about what's actually happening. Many suggested the conference was such a success that they should have it again next year in honour of the 70th anniversary of the Jewish state. Chris Mitchell, CBN News, Jerusalem. Thanks, Chris. Well, that is it for now on CBN News Watch. Have a great day, everyone.